you it's lots of posts when they're going through treatment and they're asking for prayer for healing and then the healing doesn't come and it just sort of drops off. And it's like, well, I guess we lost that one. But that is not the Christian story. The Christian story is one that says whether he heals in this life or the next, we know he will. We trust him. We are walking with a Savior who took on death for us and takes it on with us. And so that hope shines even brighter as death draws near. And Today, I'm joined by Whitney Pipkin. She's the author of We Shall All Be Changed. She's going to share her story about her mom's long battle with cancer and how we can find hope and even in our darkest moments. Whitney. Yeah. So my mom was diagnosed with cancer when I was in the seventh grade and my sister was in the fifth. So we were young. She was 41 when she was diagnosed. And then, you know, it was on and off for the rest of the 20 years that she was with us, more than 20 years um, until she died in 2020. So throughout my sister and my, um, you know, high school, college, uh, leaving home, getting married, having kids, this was kind of on the back burner of our lives. This was this backdrop. And the way that I dealt with it was largely by avoidance, um, not really dealing with it till I had to. Uh, my mom, I lived not in the same state, so I live in Virginia. And um, when my mom would visit, you know, I would, okay, Ma, what is she going to look like? How sick is she going to be? Um, what's her relationship going to be like with my kids? You know, constantly not knowing how long we had and kind of watching her to see how she was doing. Um, and it wasn't till the end that I would say I was in kind of an official caregiving role was like the last five days that my sister and I were in person. So mom was very able-bodied. Um, she was only 63 when she died. So she was still, you know, running around and working two jobs and, you know, up, up till the week she died. So she was very able to endure somehow all these treatments and years of chemo and years of um, other kinds of treatments. So I wouldn't say that I was in kind of a traditional caregiving role compared to what a lot of people deal with when a loved one or especially a parent dies, near, you know, at an older age. That's a different experience, a lot more caregiving, but there was a lot of emotional, spiritual, uh, relational kind of caregiving over those years. So navigating that relationship as it changed and uh, as it changed around the dynamics of her cancer, whether things were working, whether the meds were working or not working, really dominated my sister and my life. Um, yeah. And so it was a big part of our lives, something that I didn't deal with fully until I wrote this book after mm -hmm. she died and saw that God had been with us and in charge the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For all those years, like you, you're you knowing and knowing, like and you must have been thinking to yourself, but, you know, is she going to die next week? Is she going to die next year? You know, you, you're always living on the edge, aren't you? Yeah. And I think there's a unique aspect because she's a mother and I was her daughter. And so she was always narrating her disease to me. Uh, she was telling me, oh, I feel great, you know? And so I I became aware as I became older that that wasn't all the whole story. There was a layer of protecting her, her daughters from reality that was going on. And sometimes she would let that down and tell me how she was really doing um, in a moment of weakness or whatever. Um, but that was, that was also a dynamic is mom, you don't, you can be honest with me. You can, you know, me being concerned about her being too positive about what was going on, but it, it really wasn't until she died. And I, I read her journals that I saw that she was honest with God and with her close friends about how things were. It was just really a level of a layer of protection toward yeah. us. Um, so was her relationship with the Lord strong? Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. We've had an interesting, I, I was like a total little Pharisee growing up. You know, I, I started having my own Bible studies when I was in middle school and uh, was reading my mom's journal recently, like on Mother's Day, I'll get out letters and things like that and read them. And she was saying how she was convicted by me doing that, you know, and she wanted to be more faithful in reading her Bible. Um, but I know I just had a lot of pride and just ridiculous, you know, kind of legalism around it probably all those years. Um, so I had a lot of like skepticism about my mom's relationship with the Lord because it was different from mine. Um, but I see now that a lot of that was she didn't share the fullness of it with me. Um, you know, I read one of the most healing things I read in her, uh, what we call her cancer journal, where she, where she would write notes from appointments and then little prayers and stuff mm -hmm. throughout in response to what was going on at that appointment. Um, she wrote near the end, you know, I, 
this, this next step is either a bridge to you, Lord, um, or a bridge to stay here, you know, help me to face it, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And and that was a conversation she never had with me. So I was like, oh, I'm so grateful that she was praying that, that she was turning toward the Lord and receiving what was happening. Mm-hmm. But, but to my sister and me, she never said, I'm dying. Uh, you know, we thought like, well, why aren't we talking about what's going on? But mm-hmm. that was what she needed to do to fulfill her desire to fight for us or to be here for us. Um, even when we were like, you, we'd like you to be honest with us, you know, um, it just wasn't possible at that point to stop mothering us. Um, mm-hmm. I think in a lot of ways. Did, was your father in the picture? Was he, was he there taking care of her? What was that? So my parents were divorced since I was five. Um, my stepdad of 25 years was there with her, um, yeah, I don't know if you've been in a caregiving. It's like the women. So my sister and I typically did the the real like last the last five days the caregiving, um, the physical work of that. Just kind of, mm-hmm. it's funny. My sister and I both were nursing babies too. My youngest was five months old when mom died, and oh. hers was, is a few months older than that. So we were just really dehydrated. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, we're physically caregiving. It's a lot. I mean, hospice is there. Uh, they check in like once or twice a day, but it's really, if you're at home, which is a gift, the family members um, are doing a lot of that unless you hire additional help. Um, I don't think I knew that. I think I thought maybe hospice would do more. They told us what to do, but, you know, they gave us everything to do. And it, I mean, you're staying up, you're, you're not sleeping, you're um, wanting, not wanting to miss anything. And that was a very consolidated, you know, Mom, her body broke down in five days, but it it was a process that other people, it takes months, you know, if it's from old age or if if she hadn't been so stubborn and kept up with the meds as long as she did, you know, she just, it, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to write a book and I wanted to testify to it because I feel like things broke down categorically. So in such concise way, I could see the patterns that God had woven in even into the curse, even into mm-hmm. death, there was a mm-hmm. kindness to the way that the body made that transition into death that was awfully similar to the to birth, which I had just gone through, um, to the way that it's like these waves uh, bringing you closer to the shore that you're going toward. And uh, I don't know, I just felt like I had a unique view of that because of how uh, she'd been on meds and stuff for 20 years and was still relatively young and relatively healthy otherwise. Mm. And so when the cancer had spread then to areas that, you know, organs were shutting down, it just happened very quickly. Mm. Um, and so we could see those patterns that I think will resonate with anyone who's been through that. And I'm trying to help people name God's presence in that process, God's kindness, even in the breakdown of the body that he has made a way for um, I don't know, he's eased the impact of sin and death even, um, mm. which is something I really, I, I just found it beautiful the way that God shows up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I saw it in my brother's uh, passing. He also had cancer and passed at home like your mom mm-hmm. um, and my brother-in-law who passed last year. I can, I can understand what you go through. I can understand what somebody out there might be going through right now if they're, if it's going, if they're going through it. And, and I'm sure that um, it's not easy and it's very wearing. And if there's anybody that knows somebody that's going through it, you need to have patience with them because, mm-hmm. oh boy, not only do the care caregivers need so much love and support as far as patients, and maybe they don't answer you right away on your call or your text because they're busy helping their that person, but they they appreciate that you're standing behind them and that you're supporting them. So you went through all that for 20 years and then saw her to the end. Now it, it was like breath, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because in my friend group, I was among the first to lose a parent, although I know we will all go through it. So one of my immediate things was I want to write this down to to remember uh, the unique details of how God showed up. And I didn't want to, you know, we forget that stuff so quickly. Uh, we it, we stick to the the tragedy and the hard parts. They stick to our brains, but the good and the the richness and the details escape us very quickly. So I wrote all that down. Um, and then I just wanted 
to, so then I'm, I was like 33 when my mom died. So I wanted to live the rest of my life. It was like, I knew that we had a beginning and an end, but now these bookends were taking shape in my imagination. So I could imagine the end. Um, and it wasn't morose or, you know, it wasn't sad. It's just that it's reality. I had, by God's kindness, I had uh, taught on Psalm 90 in the year before, which is Moses's Psalm that he writes, right? But when he's told you won't go into the promised land and basically the boundary line has been set for your life and it's coming soon. And in that Psalm, he writes, you know, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so I was just living into that verse. Like, what does that really mean? What does that really look like to live wisely in in view of the end of my days? And surprisingly, that Psalm ends with, you know, therefore establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So it's not one that leads you to just twiddle your thumbs and while away the hours until your death. And in fact, it it crystallizes what truly matters and what the good works are that God has prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. Mm-hmm. And so that's what, you know, that was the perspective that I had theoretically that came into more of a focus of, okay, these days are precious in a way that there's the there's the two ditches I think we can fall into, like kind of overly nostalgia, nostalgic, um, overly precious, where we take our our kids or our grandkids and we are they're like these precious little blueberries and they're aging so quickly they're growing up and we can just like squeeze them and and then we are left with these relationships that are not what they should be because we're asking other people to be what they can never be um to give us to be our source of joy and fulfillment and we're trying to squeeze too much out of this life and there were moments like that with my mom with her relationship with me or with my kids where I felt like we were being squeezed um for every you know because she didn't have enough time um, or we can, you know, not care and kind of, you know, I'm going to die, you know, who cares what, what I do. Um, and I think when we can stay on the center of that road and not fall into those ditches, it's one of open handedness, mm-hmm. you know, the numbers of my days walking with the Lord in conversation with him, you know, what today holds. And I don't, I am limited. I cannot, you know, one of the ways that I've embodied a theology of death is through, you know, these years with sick young kids who get sick. Um, I I have chronic migraines. So I truly, there are days where I wake up and I can't do the things I want to do. And so what do I do with that? Do I shake my fist at the Lord or can I receive that with an open hand um, as from the Lord and that there is a sharing in the sufferings of Christ there, there is there is a savior who died at 33. He didn't just lose a parent at 33. He died. And so I can receive whatever my days are, whatever their number is, as from as through the fin- through the fingers of a God who gave me his only son. And and so those those shortcomings in my own body and my own life can be a string or a tether back to the one who, you know, died and rose again. They can remind me of the body of my savior. Uh, and that's, I think, the perspective that it's given me, the way that it's transformed me is a knowing of of Christ through watching someone else die and a knowing of his presence. You know, I want to live tethered to him for the few days that he gives me, whatever that, whatever that number is. That is amazing and beautiful. I, I love the way you said that because we have to focus on Christ and he has to be the center of our lives. And so um, so at this point, what what advice would you give someone who is a caretaker right now? Yeah, the average caretaker, it's it's five years is the average length of caregiving for each parent. So, I mean, these are huge seasons of our lives for many people. And we're entering into a moment in American history where the fertility rates are lower. We have people living longer. And so this sandwich generation that I'm maybe at the tail end of where people are still raising their kids and caring for elderly parents, um, it, it's a huge crunch. And so we really need to equip the saints to do it well. We need to equip the church to do it well, to support those who are caregiving so that it's not, I mean, because it is invisible. It's done inside of closed doors, um, you know, and and it is wearying. It is weary making. It is the same thing day in and day out. I, I watched my mom do this for her mom who died in two years before my mom died. So in 2018, and she had dementia and some of those other layers that were super difficult. And so it was closer to five, seven, eight years 
of just checking in all the time, handling things. And I think uh, just giving yourself grace that this is a long game and you do not know. I think that's one of the things that's so hard is it's a marathon and you don't know where the finish line is. And you are not supposed to long for the finish line because that means that your loved one is gone. And yet there comes a point where their body is suffering so much that you do begin to long for it. Similar to a woman who is so pregnant that she wants to be done being pregnant. And so she wishes for the pain of labor to come on so that she can get to the other side. And so for our loved ones who are believers, we have a very similar longing for their their suffering and their bodies to be f- complete, to be done, um, mm-hmm. so that they can be with God in, in their souls and their spirits. Um, and that that's difficult and complicated when they're not believers. And yet there there is something God does near the end of our lives in the humility of our bodies breaking down, where he breaks us open to the gospel in new ways. And so for those who are caring for those who are not easy, who are maybe not believers, um, don't stay away because it's tricky. Uh, that that hardness that you see is there's a moment where that can be broken open um, suddenly by the process of death. There's a reason, and I wish I knew exactly why I think we'll marvel at it one day, that God doesn't just snatch up the saints, that he allows us to go through the sanctifying process of death. Somehow that prepares us to be with him. Mm -hmm. And so I do know that there is a particular knowing, an experiential knowing of Christ in that physical suffering that he went through knowingly. I mean, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So whatever it is that you're suffering, whatever it is you're watching loved ones suffer, we can look to Christ who understands. He is a high priest who understands what that feels like um, for your body to to not work, to break down, to take your last breath. Mm -hmm. And by clinging to him, we can go through those waters because he went first. And Mm -hmm. so we, we cling to him, we trust him. And there's just this I, hard to describe silver lining of knowing him um, like, oh, you did this for me, this pain you took on for me um, that makes it, that sanctifies and redeems the pain. I think in glory, it will even more, we'll have a new perspective on it. But there, there is a, an experience of Christ that I don't want people to miss um, by getting stuck in a pity party or stuck you know, at a distance, not wanting to go to these hard places. Cause I do believe these are the places Christ is, would be, these are the thin places where God shows up um, in unique ways to transform us as we watch our loved ones being transformed. So much help there because we know that our help is in the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. That we know that he is the one we need to cling to is what I'm hearing you say. And it is the truth. So why is it important to talk about death openly? Well, because we will go through it. I mean, Ecclesiastes says it is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of dancing and the house of feasting. And that is because we will go to the house of mourning. Uh, It is a certainty. Um, As long as Christ tarries, we will be going to funerals. We will be losing loved ones. Um, And what's, what's really sad and tragic to me, Nancy, is that Christians have a hope in the face of death. And yet we don't talk about it. Um, we, this is kind of our like moment to shine in these conversations. We have something to offer people that um, in the face of some of the hardest things this life has to offer, we can, we can point and direct others and direct our own hearts toward eternity, which is what when we despair of this life that is passing away. It is so that our eyes will be lifted to the one that cannot be taken from us, that is imperishable, the hope that is imperishable, unfading, kept in heaven for you, you know, by Christ. So he has that hope for us. And that is what emerges in the dark valley of the shadow of death is Christ's presence that, you know, Psalm 23 says he will be with us. And also this this hope that shines even brighter in the darkness Mm -hmm. that we can hold out to one another, but not if we haven't rehearsed it. Not if we haven't tried on, how could God still be good if the worst thing happens? I mean, I spent so many years trying not to think about that question. And it wasn't until she died that I found like, this is a place God has been inviting me to know him and to connect with him, to bring him my fears and to walk more closely with him 
through this valley of the shadow of death that we walked. I mean, that's what that's what we were in all those years. Cancer is a, a form of the valley of the shadow of death. And yet our, our Christian narrative too often is one of victory only in this life. Uh, let's beat the cancer. Let's fight the cancer. And we don't have a narrative. What do we do when you, how do you turn that page to uh, the hope we have now is one of resurrection and resurrection only. That is the ultimate hope. And so how can we as Christians talk to each other more? Sorry, that late. How can we as Christians talk to each other more about um, making that that pivot from our hope is not just in this life? You know, maybe you see somebody posting on Facebook about their loved one who has cancer or they have a caring bridge and it's you. It's lots of posts when they're going through treatment and they're asking for prayer for healing and then the healing doesn't come and it just sort of drops off. And it's like, well, I guess we lost that one. But that is not the Christian story. The Christian story is one that says, whether he heals in this life or the next, we know he will. We trust him. We are walking with a Savior who took on death for us and takes it on with us. And so that hope shines even brighter as death draws near. And we need to offer that to each other, um, not in a flippant way, but in a, in a real way that we have a Savior who, you know, I keep turning to the story in John 11 when Mary and Martha are begging Jesus to come and save their brother Lazarus from this sickness that they know will lead to death. And when he shows up, they say, um, if you had been here, he would not have died. Our brother would not have died. And, and Jesus knew that. He tarried. He didn't come right away. And why did he do that? Um, you know, they're just so confused. Why did you not save him? We thought that was what you were here for. And so many Christians, that's what our faith is for, is for healing, right? And he shows up and he, not only does he not rush to the grave to to resurrect him, even though he knows he will, what Jesus does first is he stops and weeps over the fact that death had to happen at all. Uh, so he, we have in that permission to weep over death. We don't have to be just happy clappy that heaven has happened for our loved one and that they're in, quote, a better place. We can fully emote with our Savior that this is an atrocity and an affront to our humanity. Death is still the great enemy. And yet we walk with him to that full hope of resurrection. So we have Jesus with us in the dying process, and that's one of the value points is that he is with us and weeps with us. He's the man of sorrows who understands what that feels like to lose a loved one. And he also, you know, makes time to weep, makes time to say to the sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. That's why I stayed away so that I could tell you that what you need is not temporary resurrection, temporary healing. It's the source of life, the resurrection himself. That's what they needed for Lazarus. That's what his sisters needed. And that's what we need is Jesus with us, the one who is the source of life, who is our true resurrection hope. Your website, WhitneyKPipkin.com, which we'll put in the notes, um, as well as social media and her book, you can get We Shall All Be Changed. It's a deeply personal and transformative book that explores death, grief, and powerful ways we can find hope, even in our darkest moments. And this, re this book reminds us that we can experience God's very presence in life's dark and deep valleys. So Whitney, what would you like to leave my audience with today? Gosh, that a theology of death is one of the most beautiful things we can work on in our own lives because it's something we will go through. And so it benefits us to be prepared to have exercised our Christian hope so that we're ready to offer it to one another. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Call with Nancy Sabato. And if you enjoyed the conversation, please like and subscribe and stay updated on our latest episodes. And we'd like to hear your thoughts. So share your comments below and don't forget to come back next time for another inspiring episode. See you then. i mm -hmm.